Cut to podcast coming at you live from the OC Rock Radio Studio in at Saddleback College. I'm Nick Neenan. I'm Jared Smith. And uh, we got a fun day today. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. We were just we were talking about uh, before the podcast how much stuff has gone on in, in relatively um, weak time in sports where there's not a lot. Of, there's no baseball. The basketball and hockey are kind of just a stalemate, and even football is coming near near the end of the season. Still great, but it's only one day a week, and college football has now ended. Still a lot of news. We wanted to start with one of those uh, stories about something that's not in the major sports world. Uh, I know you love talking about this family and, and this guy, but we have uh, to talk about it today. Big news Lord, coming out of UCLA. We have to. Yeah. Count big news coming out of UCLA. LiAngelo Ball has been pulled by LeVar Ball from UCLA, citing reasons of that LeVar thinks the suspension on him by UCLA has been too much since that uh, that scandal with the uh, shoplifting, and he also thinks his playing time should have been more as well. Jared, I'll let you start off your thoughts on the uh, on LeVar Ball pulling the sun. Yeah, you know, I, I'm really not surprised, I guess, by LeVar's reactions <laughs> to all of this. Um, it, it's just very interesting to me. I think one of the first things that came to my mind when I heard the news that LiAngelo was getting pulled from UCLA was the fact that LeVar made this decision without telling UCLA or Coach Steve Alford. Like, yeah. like he just runs the show with everything. And another thing is like, okay, it's one thing when, you know, you want to pull your kid out of high school and homeschool him because he still lives with you at home yes. and he's technically not 18. So he's technically not an, sense. an adult, right? Makes a right? lot more sense with LaMelo, yes. LiAngelo is 18 years old, 19 years old. Yeah. He's technically an adult and he doesn't live at home. He's living at UCLA. So all these reports that say that LaVar was pulling his adult son out of college, like, like that doesn't make sense to me. If I'm LiAngelo and I want to stay, like who knows, maybe he did want to leave UCLA. And yeah. if that's the Maybe case... Maybe he voiced to his dad that he wanted to Right. Leave if that's the case, then okay. But to me, like, I haven't heard LiAngelo come out and really say anything. This is... Uh, all we've heard is LeVar Ball's voice. I want to hear LiAngelo come out and say, I didn't want to be at UCLA anymore for these reasons, A, B, and C. Yeah. Then I would feel more comfortable about the situation. Right now, it just seems like LeVar is trying to get his name back in the spotlight. Or not necessarily back in, but he's just trying to create another situation where people are talking about him again, as opposed to um, you know, letting his sons be in the spotlight and letting his sons deal with their own situations. So to me, I'm like, LeVar pulled his son out. Okay, why? Did his son want to, or was he forced? What do you think? I it's, it just seems like good old Lavar again, um, kind of running the show like you mentioned. He did it with Lamelo. Now Lamelo did make a lot more sense when he pulled Lamelo because Lamelo is a, is a celebrity in high school. A lot of times that doesn't work out. You see a lot of child actors they don't end up finishing out their high school um, years because they're too famous. It's almost a distraction for their education or for whatever they're doing, and it's definitely be a distraction for the Chino Hills basketball team. Having a celebrity and having LeVar Ball, especially now, the way LeVar has kind of turned into a uh, a media hound, almost the, uh, like we've said, the Kardashian of the sports world, uh, a guy that always needs to be in the spotlight for essentially being a dad, for being just someone that goes on TV. Uh, now with LiAngelo, like you mentioned, if LiAngelo wanted to leave, good for him. It's whatever. If you want to leave, you want to leave. But this does seem like it's good old LeVar again. Do I shouldn't even say good old LeVar, but it's it's, it's almost turned into it's it's turned into a circus with him and his family. But it just looks like LeVar is once again trying to take control, and he's done it his whole life with these kids. He ran their AAU team. He forced them to all to stay at Chino Hills and not go to Catholic schools and not go to I mean Catholic I mean private basketball teams. Um, at private schools where the basketball tends to be a little better. He created a juggernaut at Chino Hills from what started as a guy that was trying to change basketball, change the AAU landscape, not try to stack a team. He was using his sons. He's now turned into a guy that is borderline nuts with some of these decisions that he's making. Borderline? Uh, it, it's, uh, I'm going to say borderline because it didn't start like this. It's kind of turned into this. I mean, especially the stuff with... The stuff with uh, going on CNN and then and, and all the it's just it's getting ridiculous now and uh, good for UCLA though they got rid of that circus at least for uh, a year or two until if Lamelo ends up going there which I doubt's going to happen but they did get rid of that circus this year 
um, with the Leangelo problem and LeVar problem? Yeah, no, currently, as of right now, um, the, the youngest, uh, LaMelo, correct? Yes, LaMelo. Yeah. He is technically still committed to UCLA. Yeah. So That's there's right. a lot of reports and rumors that, you know, with, with this, these unravelings with Leangelo, that LaMelo, you know, eventually will, will pull his... Uh, name from UCLA and, and the chances of him actually stepping foot on campus yeah. are getting slimmer and slimmer by the day. So, yeah, no, I, if you're UCLA, I think you have to be happy, uh, you know, kind of smiling inside yeah. that the, the Ball family is no longer a part of the program. I mean, put it this way, the Ball family for for LeVar Ball, put it this way, for, for how um, just out there he is and how crazy he can be, he has really also put UCLA's name uh, in, in a lot of true. headlines, That's right? True. So yeah. that, that, that thing about um, any publicity is good publicity. For UCLA, I guess they have to be grateful in a sense that, you know, even though LeVar, LeVar Ball just spits out whatever he wants, um, you know, it has gotten UCLA, you know, a lot more looks and, and potentially more recruits. Who knows? Um, you know, it, I'm sure it's helped Steve Offord out with recruiting. Um, but I think in the long run, just the, the headache of having to, you know, go to press conferences and, and meetings and instead of answering questions about basketball, you know, related topics, Absolutely. he Steve offered and, and UCLA is having to answer questions about LeVar Ball, which I know they don't want to do. So, no. um, you know, as a whole, I think they are very happy that. Uh, potentially the Ball family is no longer going to be a part of UCLA. There's still a chance for LaMelo to go, but like we're talking about, I mean, if Leangelo's not going to go there, and LaMelo's already been pulled at a Chino Hills High School, what are the chances, especially with his own shoe, I don't even know if the NCAA restrictions will let him Yeah, no, that's go. that's another uh, you know, hiccup that could happen exa as well. Exactly. I don't even know if um, they'll let him go to UCLA. But nonetheless, I do think that UCLA is done with the Balls, I'd be very surprised if LaMelo ends up going there. and uh, But that's a very interesting take you just took on UCLA that uh, maybe this publicity has helped their basketball program out. I disagree a little bit that it would, it, it, it would help recruits. I almost think it would hurt them, especially why would you want to play with the ball kids since they kind of seem to be somewhat uh, selfish the way they play, the way they shoot threes, especially the, the younger two. Um, if you watch any Chino Hills basketball games or just go on YouTube, the game, the style of play they played without Lonzo there was ridiculous. It was essentially cherry-picking basketball, shooting threes, uh, not getting other guys involved in the game on your team. So maybe um, these guys leaving will help the recruiting. I do disagree, though, that the, the, the headlines LeVar was making um, was going to help the recruiting and going to help Steve Alford. I, I just think... The way those guys played, I actually think it helps that they now leave and you can actually play college basketball and not ball basketball. In the okay, yeah, you no, know? I think Lonzo is completely different from Leandro and no, Lamelo. I think Lonzo is definitely a passer, a guy who likes to get teammates involved. So in that aspect, I think it did help. But no, I, I, I guess I retract some of that statement. I guess you, I do agree with you that uh, the younger two kids are, are, are a little more selfish in, in their basketball oh, yeah. play. So, yeah, I guess that, that could hurt. I think just, you know, because they're in the spotlight so much, um, you know, as a, and, and today with social media, if you're a 16, 17-year-old kid, like, who doesn't want to go to UCLA, Westwood, you know, where it's sunny and 70 My sister year long, she right? Loves it. Yeah. And who wouldn't want to, not necessarily that they, you know, would love to play with the Ball family, but, like, just the spotlight and the attention, what 16, 17 year old kid wouldn't want that type of attention? No, so, 100%. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I get, I, what I get now. I get. What you, I, 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 I think it's more now, of yeah. that than necessarily playing on the court because I do agree. You know, especially with Lamelo, the kid, all he does is cherry pick and want to shoot threes all game. He's the worst. That he's ball not a uh, person that likes to get his teammates involved. At least he hasn't shown that yet. Who knows? Maybe when he gets to the college level, if he ever does get to the college level, <laughs> who knows? Does, maybe yeah. he wants. Maybe Lavar's going to send him overseas and and then uh, just you know commit to the NBA draft. Who knows? Um, at this point, nothing that this uh, Ball family does will shock me anymore. No, seriously, it's turned into that now. Where these guys, there's there's got to be news about every month or two, a big news story that we seem to have to talk to about. On this podcast, did I ever think we'd start a podcast, have an entire segment on the Ball family again? Hell no. no. Maybe Lonzo with the Lakers, but it's the NBA and stuff, but not Leangelo at UCLA and not LaMelo getting pulled from Chino Hills. I never thought that would happen. Um, 
But just going back, uh, just to, to go on my point earlier of the way they played, this is going to be super inside high school basketball here in Southern California, but when uh, Lonzo was there, they were undefeated. They dominated everybody, and they won the state championship uh, here in California. The other two last year ended up losing big games in the playoffs because of the style of play they played. They lost to teams with more rounded out basketball teams. And that's kind of my point about the way maybe UCLA was going to turn into that way if they had the two ball brothers. Because I don't think Leangelo would have been one and done. That would have been real dumb for him to do. And I would still think it's a terrible decision for him to leave UCLA. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I do think that style of basketball would have hurt UCLA's moniker. Uh, 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 that it would have hurt their name more uh, the way they would have played with Lamelo and Leangelo on the same team. So good for UCLA. But let's talk about that. Leangelo, he leaves college now. I saw a report by uh, Wooz from um, ESPN. He interviewed some GM. Uh, the GM was unnamed. And the GM said that Leangelo Ball, as of right now, is not only is he not on a, a list of like top priority draft picks, he's not even on the secondary list for guys that would be potentially go to like the G League and stuff like that. So Leangelo Ball is not going to get drafted this year and is not going to even probably get signed as an undrafted free agent. So, Jared, I want to ask you this. What does he need to do? What does Leangelo need to do? And how bad of a decision is this for him, if it's even his decision, if it's not LeVar's complete decision? How bad of a decision is this of him leaving a potential chance for him to get better in a, in a draft uh, process? Yeah, I, I, think it, I think it looks bad right now, like I said, because I, I don't believe we have heard from Leangelo get to speak on his own, mm -hmm. right? In a, in a sense where... Anytime there's a microphone or a camera in front of his face, it seems like it seems like his dad is right there. Yeah. So I want his dad gone. I want to hear Don't Leangelo. No, no, yeah, no, not not gone isn't forever. Right? Yeah. I just mean out of out of the spotlight for a minute, and I want to hear from Leangelo. What does he think? Um, is he on board with this? Is he not on board with this? Does he want to go overseas? Does he just want to train and get ready for the draft? Listen, I I, I think that's 100 percent accurate. Uh, that Leangelo is not necessarily on any NBA team's draft list because I personally do not think he's as talented as Lonzo or LaMelo. No. Um, does that mean that he will not get a chance in the NBA at all? No, because I'm sure, uh, you know, with, with injuries or, you know, if someone wants to just take a flyer on the kid, um, it's not going to cost them that much money. So, you know, do I think he will get some type of opportunity in the NBA? Yes. Do I think he's going to get drafted? No. Do I think he'll even get a chance uh, immediately in the D-League? No, I don't. I think it's going to take a lot. I think the teams are going to have to do a lot of vetting and a lot of their own um, type of uh, recruitment as far as uh, you know background checks and not only speaking with Leangelo and the family, but speaking with their friends, speaking with UCLA, speaking with all their the, the Chino Hills coaches, right, and, and really trying to dig deep and find out what is this kid about? Because obviously we know what LeVar, the dad, is about. Yeah. What is this kid about, right? Um, we know he, he's not Lonzo as far as his basketball ability. What can he do to help our team? Is he, is he an offensive guy? Um, is he a bigger body guy? Can he, can he help play defense, right? Because it doesn't, you don't need to score, you know, uh, you don't need to be a scorer and average 20, 30 points to make it in the NBA. We've seen guys, uh, Tony Allen, um, Dennis Rodman, guys Absolutely. who come in the Absolutely. league and are more defensive players and more role players, and guys who are hustle base. guys. Yeah. They do things that don't necessarily um, come up on the stat sheets, but in the end, you know, they help teams win games. So could that be uh, Leangelo? It definitely could, but I think he is going to personally have to show scouts and show teams that because right now, all we're talking about is off the court stuff. Yeah, and, and right now, like no one is talking about his on court game, which in the end, if I'm an NBA team or a GM or a head coach, that's all. That's the main thing I care about. Yeah. What can you do on the court to help the team win? And I think that's what they need to find out. Yeah, no, and you bring up the background check, what you're going to have to check. And, and uh, obviously, everybody knows the background check on Leangelo Ball now because of this whole China shoplifting scandal. Um, Leangelo did come out. Uh, I don't see they had the CNN interview. I never saw it. I never even heard it was going to happen. I th guess this was yesterday or two days ago. And Leangelo did say that he ended up stealing stuff from that shop uh, for from those shops. Let me because I think it was three shops because other guys on the team were doing it. So whether that's true or not, 
it does seem like it was more of a follower kind of thing with him. He might have not been the instigator, necessarily the guy that was going, hey guys, let's steal this stuff from the Louis Vuitton store. It was more like, oh, my teammates are doing it. I'm young. I'm going to do something stupid. He's trying to fit in. A hundred percent. And that actually makes sense to me. I could like I, That makes sense to me. If that's true, I actually do believe Leangelo. So I don't think the shoplifting thing necessarily will affect him too much as far as getting on an NBA team. I actually almost think his fame will help him over another role player getting on an NBA team later in his career. I do not think he'll be on an NBA team next year. But I do think if he goes over to Europe, does what a lot of other guys have done. There's many guys that have gone overseas or just not played in the NBA or the G League right away. And they end up being NBA players. And Leangelo, if he could learn how to play more of a real style of basketball and not the ball style of basketball where it's shooting threes, cherry picking... I think he could end up being an NBA player because he clearly has the skills. His dad has taught him enough, uh, obviously, to become a great basketball player. He got to UCLA, and he won a state championship uh, in high school. So I do believe he'd get there. Um, And I do believe the background almost will help him, as far as his fame, get on a team rather than some just random guy that come in from Iowa that, that nobody knows. So I actually do think his name might help him make the NBA more than just a random player from Wichita State would, would, would be. So I do think that would actually help him in the long run. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so so bottom line, in your opinion, um, does Leangelo Ball uh, next NBA season, because obviously he wouldn't be playing at all this year, yes. he's just going to so quote-unquote train mm-hmm. uh, this the entire rest of this season and into the offseason up until the draft, does Leangelo Ball make it on an NBA team next year at all? No, I don't believe so. Not I think, at all. I think it would take... Uh, I, I believe it would end up taking another year, a full year of uh, overseas basketball or whatever he does to turn himself into an NBA player because right now he's not. Right now he wasn't. He was the eighth or ninth man at UCLA. And UCLA isn't the number one team in the nation. They're, they're it fringely ranked. So this is not, you're not on Kentucky. You're not on one of those teams where you're not playing because there's superstars in front of you. There aren't really superstars at UCLA right now. And this guy is just an eighth or ninth man on a good basketball, good college basketball team, but not a great and unbelievable basketball team. So I do think he needs a full year, but you never know. The Lakers could just say, oh, I mean, all of a sudden Lonzo could turn into one of the best players in the league next year. And he goes, hey, let's add my brother to, 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 you know, to be on the bench. That'd be really cool for you guys to do me Salt Lake. So you never know. It could happen. But I, if I had to bet on it, and I would just was in Vegas last weekend, <laughs> uh, if I had to bet, I would say Leangelo Ball would not play until around uh, 2019 in the NBA or even longer than that. So, no, I do not think he'll be, he'll be playing next year. Okay, yeah, maybe he goes back to China. Who knows? Oh, maybe. yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> no, sure. no. And he was, you know so. what's funny? I was, I was thinking about that, too. It would be hard for LaMelo to do, because we remember Emmanuel Moutier uh, went to China. He did not go to college, and he is a fine NBA player right now. Uh, he was drafted in the top 10 in the NBA. Even LaMelo, who I see as a clear better player there than Leangelo, and maybe even better than Lonzo in some ways, he's going to struggle. If he wants to go to China or anywhere in that region, they're going to say, well, your your brother's the one that stole this stuff. Why do we want you on this? So it, it's a whole dilemma that this family's fame has caused, but again, I do think it could help them as well. So uh, it, you, you just talked about You said in the beginning of the segment, any publicity is good publicity, and I think it goes both ways with the Ball family. Uh, but nonetheless, crazy situation with with uh, UCLA and Leangelo Ball and Lavar. Like we said, we didn't think we'd talk about them, but we just spent about 20 minutes talking oh, about the Ball family once long. again. I know Jared loves this when we do this too, so we will uh, we'll try to do it again oh, next. I'm just kidding. We can't won't. Can't wait. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hopefully this ball the ball fa- hopefully the ball family goes away for a little bit. And we only talk about the on-court play of Lonzo. Please. That, seriously, that's, that's uh, I really hope happens. No problem talking about that. Because I do think it's affecting Lonzo as well with the Lakers. Not too much. We'll talk about that later down the line, too. We won't talk about that right now. We're going to go to break. Uh, we'll be right back. with. We're going to talk about the NFL. A lot of big NFL storylines. A lot of teams that I didn't expect to move up in the rankings are now moving up in their conferences and moving up in the rankings. So we'll talk about all that on the other side of this break. This is Cover 2 Podcast. On OC Rock Radio. What was your take on the Saints defense? Um, you know that's a good team. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good team, and then and, and, uh, you know if it, everything plans out right, you know we may see the, that team again. So, 
Um, you know, we just have to, you know, move forward, be optimistic of our opportunities, knowing that, you know, uh, the world just doesn't stop because the Panthers lost today. Um, you know, we have to learn from this. We will learn from this, and we, have, we will be better and prepare for, uh, you know, Minnesota. The Minnesota Viking defense dominated this offense. You watch at all three levels, they absolutely took care of them. Julio Jones, we heard it, two catches. No, 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 uh, uh, no touchdowns for Matt Ryan. They were completely out of sync. That's not, that's not a mystery. That's because of that defense, the way they did it. And you talked about it before. Case Keenum, who two weeks ago, Bridgewater's warming up or whatever it was. Zimmer doesn't want to, you know, Zimmer doesn't want to want to say, hey, it's Keenum's gig. It's Keenum's gig, and for good reason. Here they come. Almost a jailbreak. And Wilson throws and getting out in front is Doug Baldwin to the end zone. Touchdown. Andy McLeod, a safety, has to cover one-on-one -on -one against Doug Baldwin. And it takes a gutsy quarterback to make that throw because you know you cannot block everybody coming after you. And Doug Baldwin, we talked about it earlier in the drive. Just give him time. Cover 2 podcast back on OC Rock Radio. Hitting you with a little NFL talk right now. A lot of storylines going on. Uh, a, a lot of movement in the uh, in the power rankings, as, as Nick had mentioned uh, before we ended the last segment. Um, obviously, we've got some, you know, the top teams like the Eagles and the, and the Vikings and the Patriots. But even with four weeks left, there's a lot of teams teetering on Absolutely. that on that, you know, wild card mark. So uh, we're going to jump right into it and get started with that Sunday night game that featured the Seahawks and the Eagles where the Seahawks came out. And for the most part, pretty much dominated the Eagles. Uh, the Eagles, I would have to say, probably their worst game of the year. Only their second loss on the season. Totally, yeah, totally a, a their worst game. A little unexpected that the Eagles kind of look so bad. Uh, so, Nick, I want to get your thoughts on this game. And also, uh, is this uh, kind of a uh, you know a thing that the Eagles need to kind of be worried about? Worried about, or is this just was it one of those fluke games? Uh, that they that they went through throughout the season. No, I do think this is something the Eagles have to worry about because they finally got beat, and I I forget who they played this. They play the Rams this week. Yes, in L. A. So, yeah, so I knew they played somebody yeah, good. They're actually practicing uh, at Angel, Angel Stadium, Stadium and yeah, they're staying right here the street, in California. Yeah, which is probably a better place to practice right now than where the Rams practice up in Ventura because there are fires. Obviously, if anybody if anybody's heard, there are fires all over the place in L. A. Um, this week. Specifically, Ventura is the worst. The Rams actually aren't even uh, able to practice right now because their field is so close to those fires. Their practice field is so close to those fires. So, uh, obviously, uh, just to take a second, just say uh, hopefully everybody's safe up in Ventura and up in L.A. I knew there was a new fire actually near the Getty Center new, near uh, UCLA today. So, hopefully everyone's safe up there. Hopefully the Rams players are safe as well. Uh, and and it, it's just interesting. Uh, we talk about the Eagles. I do think... They need to worry a little bit about this loss to the Seahawks because the Seahawks um, necessarily weren't, they didn't look too good coming in this game. I thought the Eagles would beat them. And that's not just because of a biased perspective because I'm a Cardinals fan and I don't like the Seahawks. I did think the Eagles were just that good that they'd end up being the Seahawks because the Seahawks offensive line isn't that good. They don't have running game. The defense is depleted. But like you mentioned, the Seahawks dominated Philadelphia in this game. I think the Eagles need to be concerned because they play back-to-back -back tough teams. And if they lose to the Seahawks and the Rams this week, and they lose to the Rams like they did the Seahawks, they're not technically going to be one of the better teams in the NFL anymore. And I'd put a lot of teams ahead of them. So they really need to come out and get a win this week. But nonetheless, talk about the Seahawks a little bit. They just seem to always do this, don't they, Jared? They seem to always turn around later in the season. Pete Carroll knows how to do it late in the season. And the Seahawks have once again proven they are more than likely going to be a playoff team this year. And they're a team to be reckoned with, especially at home. I think if there's one silver lining that talking about the Eagles was that you weren't at home. You were on the road in probably the toughest stadium to play, especially in the NFC, uh, the toughest stadium to play in. So that helps your cause as far as the fact that you lost and you had a tough time. It was also raining during the game. But the Eagles, with a, such a big game, in L.A., they're not going to be able to go home. Like I said, they're practicing here in Orange County. 
this is a big game for them, and they really need to win. Yeah, uh, just quickly, I, I don't want to hear any excuses about the weather or the rain. They, they play in Philadelphia <laughs> in an outdoor stadium you. for a living, yeah. okay? So, no, I, I don't want to hear that. I don't think that was uh, a reason why but they kind of But that crowd does bad. make a difference. The crowd is a huge factor, yes. one of the loudest stadiums in the NFL. Listen, I'm looking at the stats right now. Carson Wentz still put up 348 yards. So it's not like they came out and did nothing. No. I think one of the biggest issues was uh, their running game. Um, Jay Ajayi and LeGarrette yep. Blunt, their, their two main running backs, uh, only combined for uh, like just over 50 yards. So, uh, listen, obviously Carson Wentz can, can chuck the ball wherever he wants, but you need to be a little more balanced, especially on the road and especially in an environment like that. So I think that was one of the main reasons why the Eagles look so bad. And I think you do just have to give a lot of credit to the Seahawks and Russell Wilson uh, still with that bad offensive line and not necessarily uh, a good offense in general. You, you kind of have, uh, it's kind of like a revolving door with their running back. It's like, it's like running backs by committee uh, with Eddie Lacy, Rawls, uh, I believe Mike Davis, yeah, Mike who they kind of signed off. They signed from? him off the practice squad, and he's now like their their number one running back. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. it's like literally every week you don't really know who is going to be you know uh, leading this offensive team other than Russell Wilson. But they just seem to find a way to get it done, especially at home. So I have to give a lot of props to the Seahawks team. Um, for the Eagles, I, I think this is one of those fluke games. I think they've really been able to cruise throughout the majority of this season uh, because of the way that their division has been so poorly with, with the Cowboys, Giants, and Redskins um, being you know so kind of up and down. So I think it's just human nature for this Eagles team to eventually say, hey, listen, you, know, you maybe don't have that same intensity as you would if some of these other teams were keep creeping up right behind you or maybe if you didn't have you know such a big lead in the division. Yeah. Um, so I think they kind of, with this loss, I think it woke them up a little bit, knowing that they have to play a very, very tough Rams team this upcoming Sunday. Um, I think they're going to come out with a little more energy, a little more firepower, and I would expect a much closer game this week. So um, even though I, I don't like saying this because I am a Cowboys fan, I think it was just a fluke, and I think this Eagles team is too talented to come out and have back-to-back -back weeks uh, of kind of, you know, basically nonchalant football. Well, yeah, and one, one, of the, one of the reasons I stress that they really need to win this Rams game, uh, this is another reason, actually, is that they are now second place in the NFC. The Vikings are now in first place. We're going to talk about the Vikings in just a second. But they're now in second place. If they lose to the Rams, because the Rams have a 9-3 and record, the Eagles with a 10-2 and record, the Rams would then move into second place, and the Eagles would be out of a bye in the first in the in the first round, barring the Vikings or Rams losing a couple games down the season, so the Eagles, they might have just turned into in a two week span. This is why I stress this: the game is so important against LA this week. In a two week span, they could go from the best team in the NFL to not even having a bye, and that is a big thing, uh, especially when they just showed that they if they go into a tough environment in Seattle. They could lose, and they could look really bad. So they want as many home games as they possibly can. They obviously want the first seed because they played great in Philadelphia this year. They don't want to go on the road because they showed in Seattle they didn't play good at all. Yeah, no, not at all. And just to quickly mention, the, the Rams and the Saints are sitting at 9-3. and three. The Eagles are currently 10-2. and two. Uh, obviously, we already mentioned that the Eagles play the Rams this week. So if the Rams beat the Eagles, they're going to jump into that second place That's spot. What saying, yeah. And depending on what happens with the Saints, yeah, you're right. The Eagles could go from uh, you know having a first round bye to a wild card spot. <laughs> no, maybe not a wild card spot, but maybe not being a that card, being, the, win fourth, the, division. Yeah, being yeah, yeah. the fourth seed and winning that division. So no, you're right. Um, a lot is still at stake for this team, even though they are ten and two. And uh, no, they can't take these last four games of the season lightly at all. Because if they do. You're right. They can find themselves going from a first round by staying at home for two weeks, sleeping in their own beds to having an away game in the second uh, round in the, yeah. in the second round, um, even with that good record. So, you know, very, very good game. One of uh, one of the, the marquee matchups that I'm definitely looking forward to watching this Sunday. Absolutely. So let's turn into there. Let's move on to the number one team in the NFC. That is the Minnesota Vikings. They continue to play well against good teams. They continue to win with Case Keenum as their quarterback. They beat the Falcons in a tough defensive battle, 
fourteen to nine. They were actually losing most of the, most of the time in that game. Ended up scoring a big touchdown in the fourth quarter to get the win. Uh, but Jared. How legitimate are the Vikings? We obviously know they have a great defense. But for some reason, this running game has stepped up. No matter who they run, whether it be Latavius Murray or Jarek McKinnon, it seems to work out for them. Their receiving game is great. Stephon Diggs, Adam Thielen running the show there. You have Kyle Rudolph as a tight end. Is this team, I think this team is legit. I think Case Keenum has shown that he is a, is a good quarterback when he has a good team surrounded uh, around him. I think the Vikings are legit. What do you think about that? I do, and they've proven that they're legit. At the beginning of the year, when you said, if you would have said Case Keenum leading a playoff caliber yeah. team, I would have laughed in your face. Especially what happened with the Rams last year. Exactly. So. It, it was actually interesting, and I just want to bring this up really quickly. If Case Keenum were, on, were still on the Rams under Sean McVay, do you think Case Keenum will be doing the same thing he's doing right now in, in Minnesota? I actually do believe he'd be doing I think Sean McVay is a great coach, and we'll talk about the Rams maybe later in the segment. Yeah, now, so, I just I had to bring that up really quick because I'm like, is it is it really Case Keenum I think or is it, was, it the system I think that it was in? Jeff freaking Fisher who <laughs> ruined almost ruined Jared Goff's career and, om- and almost uh, put Case Keenum as a backup. Good thing, amazingly, that Sam Bradford got hurt and Teddy Bridgewater wasn't able to come back because Case Keenum probably – wouldn't have had this chance, but he's taking advantage of it. And like you said, like you were just saying, uh, who would have thought Case yeah. Keenum being a star quarterback? But extend on more of your talking. No, about. I think there's uh, there are two keys to this team, uh, success keys, which is why they're having uh, you know so much success this season. One is the offensive uh, receiving threat with Stephon Diggs and Adam Thielen, mm-hmm. literally a two headed monster who now. You have to put them up there as one of the top receiving duos, if not the top receiving duo. Who would have said that? Duo, yeah. I'm sorry, in the NFL, um, along with Case Keenum playing so well. And secondly, I think it's this this defense that you can hang your hat on. And I've said this many times. I'm going to say it again. Defense wins championships. When you get into the playoffs and you have to go play teams in cold weather situations, Ooh. it's defense. This team is second in the NFL, only giving up 17 points a game. If you only give up less than 20 points a game, you have a phenomenal chance of winning. Every single Especially week. with this offense right now. Um, so, no, I think they're rolling on all cylinders. They're really, really balanced. And I think they can go up and compete against any team in the NFL, whether you're talking about the Eagles, the Patriots, it doesn't matter. This team is not afraid to go into any stadium. And right now, uh, you have to put them as the favorites in, in the NFC, uh, especially by the way the Eagles have played last week. No, yeah, and what's interesting, we we're talking about, oh, how if the Eagles lose, they're dropping down. The Vikings are still going to be in first place after this week, oh, essentially, no matter what happens, because they already beat the Rams. They took care of the really good teams they needed to play. And so the Vikings are in a really good place, especially we're talking about how important that buy is. That Vikings stadium that they just built, that's a great place to play as well. Potentially, the Vikings could have a home game in the Super Bowl. They could play the first entire time, playoff. First time Yeah, ever. the Cardinals actually had a chance back in, uh, I believe it was 2014 and 2015, to get into the Super Bowl. That was the last team to really have a chance. Now the Vikings, with even more of a legitimate chance than I think the Cardinals had that year, was the Cardinals were a wild card team in the playoffs. The Vikings, being the number one seed, could have literally the entire playoffs at home. How amazing and would that ha- be? Exactly, and that would be great. Clearly for the Vikings and all their fans. Uh, but wow, that would be very interesting to see a Super Bowl uh, with the Vikings in it. But let's not move ahead. Yeah, lose. that's a they little... They could end up 10-6 and six for all we know. Right. They don't look like they are. I'm trying to think of a team, and I'll come up with it eventually in this segment. The Vikings do remind me of a, te- of a team. It might be the Falcons from last year where it just seems like no matter who you play, especially on offense, they just do well. The entire offense works out. I'll think of it later. It might be the Falcons. I don't think it is, though. But the, the, it just seems like they are running on all cylinders. And this Viking team, they're fun to watch. They, uh, anytime, any team with a really good defense like that is fun to watch as well. So uh, who did they play this week, real quick, just so we can preview that game? They're, they're at the Panthers. They're at the Panthers. Ooh, so that, that is down. another big game. Yeah. You, know? you want to win that game. The Panthers are 8-4. and four. Uh, you, you obviously with only two losses, the Panthers only have four. You want to beat any of the teams below you, and the Vikings have every team below them. So you want to take advantage of uh, as many of those big games as you can. Uh, I would take the Vikings in that game, though the Panthers don't seem to me like they're um, too much in the hunt for a, a top seed in the playoffs. But let's actually 
Do you have anything else to say about the Vikings? Because I'm actually fine with moving on to the Saints Carolina game since I was just talking about them. Let's move on. Let's move on. So Saints and Carolina uh, was last week. The Saints beating the Panthers for the second time. <clears throat> second time, excuse me. This year, uh, for me, Carolina, and we were actually talked about this last week. Carolina is too inconsistent to beat good teams. Uh, they end up losing 31-21. I don't even think it was that close most of that game. I, I just think the Saints dominated that game. Carolina, to me, if I had to pick one team that's in the playoffs right now that will not make the playoffs, I think it's the Carolina Panthers. They still play the Falcons this year. They proved that they could not beat the top team in their division, the Saints, twice. Um and and Carolina, it just seems like, and they obviously play the Vikings this week, if there's one team that I don't think is going to make the playoffs, it's Carolina. What is your, What are your thoughts on the Panthers? No, I, I have to agree with you in pretty much everything that you said uh, to an extent. They, they, the key word, inconsistency. Yeah. And it starts with Cam Newton, their $100 million quarterback. Listen, he it's not that Cam Newton had a bad game. He didn't throw any interceptions. He threw for two touchdowns, but he only threw for 183 yards. Yeah, in the happen. NFL, that's just not good enough. Um, this Carolina defense that is what I thought was a little underrated coming into this season – I don't think it's played up to their expectations. Yeah. We've got Luke Keekley, uh, Davis. Their, their secondary, which a couple years ago, after they lost Josh Norman, was literally full of a bunch of rookies. They're now in their second and third years, so you can't really you know, sit here and say, oh, it's, it's a bunch of rookies anymore. They've had enough experience to try to get things right. Uh, and this team is known for building through their offensive and defensive line. They have a bunch of first and second round draft picks on this defensive line. So for me, I think it comes... Um, it's it's not really on all on Cam Newton's shoulders. I think it's a lot to do with the defense as well, and they're not holding up their end of the bargain. So yeah, you're right. They're too inconsistent. You know, they go one week and they can put up thirty points on you, and then the next week they put up you know thirteen points and they give up thirty. It's just it, you don't really know what you're going to get from this team. Uh, like you mentioned, they they've already lost to the Saints twice. They've lost to the Eagles. They had a really really horrible loss to the Bears, even though that was on the road. Uh, you only put up three points against the Bears. Come on. That's, that's kind of pathetic. Um, I mean, they did have a good win against the Falcons. Um, and, Which I is mean, big. That is big. Uh, they did beat the Patriots as well, and that was uh, week four. So that was, uh, you know, essentially a long that's time ago. That's what I'm saying. How do you but, lose the Bears and beat the right? Patriots? It, it, it's just it's, it's way too. So, no, I, I do agree right now. Uh, the Panthers would be one team that you definitely can't lock into this playoffs. They are they are way too up and down, and uh, we're gonna get to this in a in a little bit shortly. But uh, I think there's a couple teams, including my Cowboys, mm -hmm. and potentially the return of Aaron Rodgers, that might take they over are. this Carolina team. We'll get to that in a little while. Uh, but I do just want to give my quick thoughts on the Saints. Uh, who would have thought? That the you know the yep. Saints with Sean Payton and Drew Brees that they will be known as a a kind of uh, run uh, first team yeah with a good defense too. right that that just it doesn't it <laughs> doesn't make heck? sense it doesn't even seem right to say that when I think of the Saints I think of an air raid I think of like Mike Leach and the and the Washington State Cougars I think of you know four hundred yards passing fifty uh, passing attempts a game and then like you know maybe fifteen uh, potentially twenty rushing attempts. If they're lucky. Right now, they have a two-headed monster with Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara. And these two really have taken a lot of pressure off of Drew Brees. To where Brees doesn't have to win the games by himself. This team can lean on this running game. Uh, you know, run the clock. Uh, keep their defense off the field. Which I think is a big reason why their defense has played so well. Because they don't have to be on the field the whole yeah, game. Yeah, no, totally. I don't care who you are. You can, w when you're on the field for, you know, 30 to, to 40 minutes a game... You're, I don't care how good your stamina is, you're going to get tired, you're going to have lapses, and that's when you, you have mistakes. Because his defense has been able to stay fresh, I think that's a big reason why they've been able to force turnovers and, and play so well. So, no, this Saints team is very scary, especially at home. On the road, um, I wouldn't necessarily trust them as much on the road, but at home, they're in a dome. It's another one of those stadiums that's really, really tough to play in if you're an opponent because of that noise. So um, this is another scary team that I would not want to play in the playoffs. Nine and three, one game out of first place in, in the NFC, one game out of being a bye. This team is legit. It's mainly because, like you just said, the running game. 
Alvin Kamara, I'm actually going to say he's essentially been the MVP of this team, in my opinion. Rookie of the year. Ro- well, rookie of the year, but I think he's been the guy that they needed to boost that offense even more. Because with him, and it reminds me a lot of David Johnson with the Cardinals, they drafted him essentially as the guy that can catch passes. But his running ability is outstanding as well. Then you, when you mix that with Mark Ingram, it's a two-headed monster running back that's probably better than any team in the league. It reminds me a lot of uh, Freeman and Coleman in Atlanta, and now even the Vikings with McKinnon and, and Murray. Just these, these offenses that can really run the hell out of the ball. The Saints' defense has played way better than I thought. I think it has to do with, like you were mentioning, you're keeping the defense off the field. Drew Brees is a Hall of Fame quarterback. You're always going to play well when you're with him. This t- Saints team's legit to me as well. I think they're, they're clearly better than the Carolina Panthers. Uh, uh, they're up there with the Eagles now. The Eagles did disappoint. The Saints really haven't disappointed that much this season as well. So this is a team to be reckoned with uh, in this NFC. They have a tough place to play. You, want, you, you don't want to have to play them in their place. So you want, um, you want to keep all these teams ahead of them. Want to stay, uh, they want to keep the Saints as that fourth team in the playoffs. And as much as you can do that, that helps. But I think this Saints team is as legit as it gets. And uh, I just think this NFC is just packed with really good teams. And that's why all these games matter every single week because uh, all these teams are so close in record, you know. Every team in the NFC that's in the playoff picture right now is two games out of first place or in first place. So it's crazy right now, and, and, and it's fun to see. Now, let's talk about, you were just mentioning, there are teams on the fringe right now that could possibly get in. We said that the team that more than likely would not make the playoffs is Carolina. There are two teams that we are not thinking of, and they both have returning players later in the season. One being, obviously, Ezekiel Elliott, not coming off injury, coming off suspension. The other being A.A. Ron, Aaron Rodgers. A.A. Ron. Aaron Rodgers is, is the scout team quarterback right now for the Packers. He's playing in practice. He can't come back with the IR rules until week 15. But if he's already practicing in practice with the team as a scout quarterback and he can throw the ball, I mean, he's going to come back. And this, this Packers team is 7-5. and five, Are they 7-0? No, they're 6-6, six and six, correct. So they still have a chance. Only two games out of the playoffs. The Cowboys, they are 6-6 six and six as well, correct? Yes, they are. Six, six. So both these teams don't count them out. These are two teams that are going to get players return. They look better than they did earlier in the season. Let's talk about the Cowboys first, because I know, you, I know you'll have a lot more to say about this than the Packers. Cowboys, finally played a good game for the first time in a while. I know you're happy about this. They beat, I'm blanking on, they beat the Redskins. Yes. 38-14. to 14. That's a drubbing. The Redskins are another team that we thought might sneak into the playoffs. Not anymore, as, at least in my opinion, because the Cowboys showed they're back, and Dak Prescott played really well Jared, how excited you are, and how well do or how uh, how good is the chance that the Cowboys end up making the playoffs? Uh, listen, they obviously dug themselves a big hole by you know starting the season six and six. Not having Ezekiel Elliott was a, a major issue. I I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm I'm very confident this team is going to make the playoffs. Uh, they have a, a not only do they need to almost win out the rest of the season, but they also need help from other teams. And when you have to rely on other teams to win games or lose games, that right there, you're almost setting yourself up for disaster. Uh, the, the good thing is, like you mentioned, Ezekiel Elliott will be back in a couple weeks. Uh, and it, it finally seemed like this team uh, was able to find somewhat of a rhythm offensively without Zeke. They did get a, a, a big boost in Ryan Switzer, who was one of their draft picks this year, uh, known as being a uh, return special teams yeah. guy and also like a, a Cole Beasley Wes Welker where he's a smaller receiver in the slot he had a punt return touchdown which was actually a big key in the game because uh, right before the the previous possession by the Cowboys Dak Prescott had injured his right throwing hand and I believe it was his thumb he was he went into the very locker swollen yeah very swollen went into the locker room uh, came back out and was throwing passes but still didn't seem right uh, Ryan Switzer, that very next punt, 
was able to take it to the house for a touchdown, which saved Dak Prescott from coming on the field right away. It gave him an extra five to ten minutes to get that hand ready, and I think that was pretty significant because if if Ryan Switzer would not have returned that touchdown and the Cowboys offense would have had to come on the field right away, I think they would have had to put, had to put their backup in, who um, uh, uh, Cooper, Cooper Rush, who is a rookie and has never played an NFL down. So I think that's really well, significant. Never. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's right, very right. significant. They, they, uh, they got rid of Kellen Moore, um, the only left-handed quarterback right. in the NFL, by the way. Uh, got rid of him. That's insane. Yeah, and they, they brought on Cooper Rush, who's a rookie. So I think it was a very significant play, and I think it gave this team a big boost. Another reason why uh, this team, I think, played so well, they switched up a lot of their defensive players. They benched a couple of their starters, brought in some younger rookies who uh, in the beginning of the year were were kind of injured and, and you know kind of playing a game, out for two games, coming back. Uh, they seem to be finally healthy. Uh, Xavier Woods, um, uh, Chidobi Awuze, if Awuze. I'm saying his name, Awuze, yeah. I'm sorry if I'm uh, butchering your name. I'm just, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and then uh, so they ha- they have a lot of young rookies that they kind of kind of put right into the fire in this game yeah. against a high powered Redskins offense. And uh, along with Kevin Frazier, I forgot to mention him. He had a heck of a game, more of a strong safety, big hitter guy. Uh, so these guys came out and just played fearless. Listen, they don't have a lot of experience, and when you you know get later in the season in the playoffs, that's not necessarily something that you want to you know hang your hat on as a bunch of inexperienced rookies in your secondary. But they came out and they said, "Listen, we can't do any worse than what these other guys have done so far. So we're just going to come out and play loose." They definitely did that. Uh, so I'm encouraged by that and the fact that Zeke is coming back. I just think it's going to be a tough. Uh, battle for this team to get into the playoffs because of how poorly they played so far. Yeah, essentially Dallas has to win out. Uh, the one thing that does help them though is when Zeke comes back, they do play the Seahawks, which is one of those teams in the wild card right yes. now. Because the Cowboys are not going to win the division. That's They're actually Zeke's gonna... first game back. If exactly. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, exactly. So they do have that one-on-one matchup with a playoff team that they need to beat. So that does help the process. Only being two games back, they do need to win every other game for the rest of the season. But that definitely helps. I do think this Cowboys team could win most of the games for the rest of the season. I do see them winning nine or ten games. Uh, it might be a little too late, but I do think this team is good enough now that if they were to get in the playoffs, they'd be a team to reckon with, especially with Ezekiel Elliott. We see the difference without him, the difference with him. It's it's a clear difference. Yeah. We have to go to break. Uh, we will talk about Aaron Rodgers in the Do You Care segment. We got a lot to talk about Do You Care. Oh, yeah. A lot of stuff. We have... Baseball, where is uh, where is Otani going to end up set, uh, uh, signing, signing with? He's got seven teams on his list. We have Giancarlo Stanton still waiting to see if the Dodgers are going to sign him. We have uh, that crazy Bengals-Pittsburgh Steelers game with so much news coming out of it. So we'll talk about all that. Also, Kevin Durant's a bad boy now in the NBA, I guess. <laughs> so we'll be right back. Do you care on the other side of this break on the Cover 2 podcast? <laughs> a peel back block and that's going to be a fine and that's going to be that's ridiculous you know you, you, you spend a lot of time on education on all what's legal play. and what isn't personal foul unnecessary roughness number 19 number 19's first unsportsmanlike foul of the game yeah there's no room I am for penalties and suspensions uh, Gronk's 270 pounds I would have no problem if the league kept Gronk out as long as the Buffalo Bills player is out. Uh, By the way, that's how the National Hockey League... I like the hockey rule on that. It's eye for an eye. Yeah, if if it's... By the way, if it's accidental, it's one thing. But if you believe it is a premeditated cheap shot, keep the football player out as long as the uh, uh, oppressed player is out. What was going through your mind when the injury happened? That I had to call my dad and tell him I can't play golf tomorrow in (laughs) Charlotte. That was actually the first thought. Nice play. <laughs> <laughs> that was a dumb play because I tried to go for a steal and obviously it was just a bang bang. Uh, got caught on um, Etwan's shoe as I went by him and couldn't catch myself. So just you know, obviously it hurt, but uh, I wanted to kind of get back here and get get ice on it and you know, get the rehab process started as soon as possible. We are back here on the Cover Two podcast. And Jerry, you know what time it is? What time is it, Nick? It's time for Do You Care? <laughs> we got a lot to talk about, too, uh, on this segment, Jared, because we got a lot of football. We got a lot of baseball. 
And we even have some basketballs. We got some guys trying to act like bad boys in basketball that normally oh, aren't bad boys. I so wonder who. I know. I wonder who it could be, right? We even got rolled ankles on uh, Do You Care this week. But uh, So, Jerry, I'll give you first question. Do you care that Aaron Rodgers might return week 15? I do care. Uh, it is obviously a, a big deal to have the former NFL MVP and still probably when healthy, the best uh, quarterback in the NFL back on your team. Uh, this Packers team, even though Brent Hundley uh, has come in and has not played a down up until this year, he's kept his team afloat. And that's all I think anyone can ask for. But now with Aaron Rodgers potentially coming back week 15, uh, this team is still in the hunt. And like we mentioned, we don't think Carolina is going to uh, be in that wild card spot. So uh, the Packers could potentially take that last wild card spot if Rodgers is able to get this team back on track. I think an interesting thing to note, uh, a couple of Packers players uh, have been reportedly saying that you know they wish Rodgers did not go on injured reserve. Uh, when you place a player on injured reserve, there's two types of injured reserve. One is for the entire season. Mm -hmm. If they would have done that, obviously Aaron Rodgers would not be able to come back at all. Uh, the other is like the short-term reserve, which is for eight weeks. Eight weeks yeah. uh, so Rodgers, I forget exactly when he was placed on it, but he can't come back till week 15. Um, if he was not placed on injured reserve, then potentially he could be playing this week or even next week. So... Um, you know, it's one of those things where obviously you want to make sure he's completely healthy before you bring him back. You don't ever want to rush him, you know, before he's before he's ready. But he's obviously an easily an upgrade over uh, Brett Hundley. So um, if he can come back and this team can, you know, go one and one or two and zero oh in these next two weeks, then you've got to give the Packers a good chance at, at making the playoffs. Nick, do you care? Uh, Steph Curry rolled his ankle and could potentially miss two weeks. Uh, I do care about this because Steph Curry, the reason that there was even um, a sketchy point to draft him and there was a reason he got a small contract in the beginning of his career was because of his ankles. So the more he does stuff to his ankles, the more there's risk that he could get hurt and have it affect him for his entire career. This particularly uh, rolled ankle was very bad looking. I mean, it looked like, I don't even know how his foot didn't detach from his leg. That, that's how bad it looked. So it also came uh, in um, garbage time, essentially, in a game. too. So you hate to see that as well. But for Steph Curry and the Warriors, you almost need to be concerned that these ankle injuries need to stop happening because I believe this has happened twice already during this season. And for it to... Uh, continue to happen to him, especially with how bad his ankles were earlier in his career and how much it affected him. Uh, this is nothing but a bad thing for the Warriors, and, and they need to uh, hope that this doesn't keep happening. Obviously, a rolled ankle, he may never roll his ankle ever again in a basketball game, but he could also roll it eight more times. And the more his ankles, particularly out of any other player, the more his ankles get injured, the more there's a chance that it could affect him for the rest of his career. So for Warriors fans, you want to hope that he stops doing that. Especially him being out two weeks, that means it was it was a significant role as well. So not good for the Warriors. Uh, so hopefully Steph can can stay in there because that would suck. Obviously, if a great player uh, got hurt for his career, uh, Jared, more Warriors stuff. Do you care that Kevin Kevin Durant seems like he's getting thrown out of games left and right? I do care. Um, I think Kevin Durant uh, he's trying to you know change his image. And it's not working. Or if he's trying to change it, he's changing it in a negative way. He came into the league, like, soaking wet, weighing, like, 150 pounds. Brandy I mean, yeah, no, seriously. Like, he couldn't even bench press the bar, which weighs 45 pounds. I'm not trying to sit here and mock the guy. But I'm saying, like, he's not Kinda one of those. sounds like you're doing that. He's, he's not a threat, right? Um, I, if I'm saying this correctly, I hope I am with this stat. <laughs> His, uh, his 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 entire tenure with Oklahoma City Thunder, which was like 812 games or something like that, he only got thrown out of a game once. He has already been thrown out of three games uh, this season with the Warriors. Listen, I, I understand that like everything that happened, you know, you left, you you took a lot of heat from not only fans but I'm sure other uh, NBA players as far as leaving the Thunder and jumping on the the Warriors bandwagon to an extent, um, but. You come out and, and you show players, uh, you know, your your image, and, and you do that with your play. 
I don't think he needs to come out and try to be a bad boy, you know, uh, Draymond Green or one of these guys that's going to just, you know, sit here and elbow people and get in referees' faces and all that stuff. That's not his game. That's not what got him to the NBA. That's not what made him an MVP, um, and, and that isn't what made him so successful today. What he's doing right now, I think he's not only hurting himself, I think he's hurting uh, his team. And in the long run, I don't think he's going to – listen, Kevin Durant is is better on the floor – Right then, off the floor, you're not helping your team when you get ejected from the game, especially when Stephen Curry is going to be out for at least two weeks. So he needs to get his act together. I, I don't know if Steve Kerr needs to sit down and have a talk with him and say, "Hey, listen, man, like we want you to be a leader on this team, but this isn't the way that you lead." So I don't know what it's going to take for him to figure it out. But um, get back to just playing basketball, dude. Do what you do best. Stop trying to sit here and and you know jab jabber with all these other players because that is not what made you a successful. NBA player. Nick, do you care? Uh, Jim Harbaugh has trolled Michigan State head coach Mike D'Antoni on Twitter. No, I don't care. The only reason this question is on here is because the fact that Jim Harbaugh seems to think he has more clout in college football than he really does. Uh, Jim Harbaugh and the Michigan Wolverines have been a disappointment the last two years, to be honest. They started so great to that season um, last year, you know, they had essentially a home game every game to start their season, which helped. But they, I remember they were like 8-0, 9-0, whatever it was, and then they ended up losing like the next three games to end the season. Jim Harbaugh is about, has, has about the fourth or fifth best team in the Big Ten this year, okay? I even could, you could part, say that, that uh, Michigan State might have been a big, better team than them, to be honest. So... For Jim Harbaugh to be, you know, uh, trolling people and, and talking crap on Twitter, is it, it's dumb. I, I don't care about it. And the guy needs to just know his role and, and just know that what, what he's doing doesn't make a lot of sense. So, um, it, Jim Harbaugh, know your role, man. Like The Rock used to say, know your role and shut your mouth. Uh, Jared, do you care? Speaking of The Rock... Do you care that uh, Gronk was only suspended one game for his elbowing of uh, Tredavious White? Yes, I definitely care about this. Uh, for those who have not seen the play, go back and look. Uh, Gronkowski ran a route. He was covered by the Bills cornerback Tredavious White, who's a rookie. Uh, Tredavious White came up with the interception. It looked like on the play that Tredavious White kind of was holding Gronk's jersey originally at the beginning of the play. And then later on when the ball was thrown... Uh, White kind of uh, like, you know, pushed, extended his arm and shoved Gronk essentially out of the play. White ended up making the interception, fell to the ground, um, you know, essentially giving up. Play was over. Whistles were blown. And literally two or three seconds after the play, Gronk comes back in and literally people elbows. It gives the people people's elbow to Tredavious White. Um, just it was the dirtiest play I've seen in a while. No, it was. And it, not only the fact that he did that, but it's just so late after the play. Like, completely blatant. Like, you have... The, the fact... I heard that Gronk actually appealed this. Like, oh, come on, like, Gronk. For what, dude? Gronk. You have zero, zero, like, a chance of getting this uh, rescinded at all. Honestly, I think he should have been suspended at least three games, if not the rest of the regular season. This is something that... Uh, Chadavius White, I believe... Uh, suffered a concussion from this. Yeah, that's terrible. It could have been way worse. Tredavious White is, I think he's like six foot, maybe 195 pounds, maybe 200 pounds. Gronk is like, what, six, six? At six, 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 two, like six. Like 260? Yeah. That's a big man. And when all of that weight is coming down on a smaller player, um, that right there is it not only risk for injury, but it's just, it's it's not a, uh, a sportsman-like play. It, it has no business being in football at all. And even Bill Belichick, at the end of the game, uh, usually the, the two head coaches always come to the middle of the field and shake hands. Bill Belichick came to uh, the Bills head coach, Sean McDermott, and I'm not, I can't exactly say what he said because he used a couple cuss words, but he basically said, hey, that, that's BS what Gronk did. You know, I'm really sorry about that. So yeah. I'm sure, I guarantee you that Mr. Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick have had a talk with Gronk. Um, and Gronk is very, very lucky that he only got suspended one game because, like I said, um, he should have been suspended for at least the, the rest of the regular season, and I would have had no problem with that at all. Yeah, that was a, that was very dirty. Play. Yeah, very. Uh, speaking of dirty plays, Nick, do you care about the reckless violence that was in the Bengals-Steelers game? I, I do care for multiple different reasons. 
Uh, number one, obviously, let me start with this. Uh, hopefully, Ryan Chazier is okay. And this had nothing to do with the violence in this game. This has to do with uh, Chazier uh, lowered his head. He tackled the wrong way. I, I don't even know who he hit. Uh, but instantly went down, grabbed his back, and couldn't feel his legs. Uh, a lot of people thought there was a chance he might be paralyzed. Uh, from what I've heard so far, he's not paralyzed. And I think he's in the hospital. They're waiting a couple days to really announce what's happened with him. But from what I've heard, it essentially is it's a, it's a spinal contusion. And uh, when uh, Tommy Maddox had this, another Steelers player, he actually ended up playing a couple weeks later. So... Ryan Shazier, I do think, um, dodged the bullet here, but that was a very scary moment. And you were watching that game with all the violence and stuff like that and all the big hits and Le'Veon Bell running people over and stuff, and you always thought back to, oh, man, Shazier's in the hospital. Shazier might be paired, you know. So it was not, it was a very crazy game. I want to start with that. Now on to the, the, the dirty hits in this game. This was probably the most physical game I've seen in a while, I can't really remember a game in this era of the NFL being this physical. You have, of course, the Juju Smith-Schuster hit on Vontez Perfect. Le'Veon Bell continually running over guys, um, playing very physical. Uh, George Ioka's hit to the head of Antonio Brown in the end zone. Uh, crazy game. The one thing I want to say about the, the violence in this game is that these two teams, you have to understand hate each other. Uh, you can remember two years ago, Vontez Perfect, that illegal hit on Antonio Brown that ended up essentially knocking the Steelers out of the playoffs. Um, you can remember countless other times where these teams have gone after each other. I, I believe the Steelers um, might have been in, in the, the case when Carson Palmer tore his ACL with the Bengals back in the day. So these two teams have had a long history of hating each other. So you have to know that it's going to be more physical in these games. Obviously, it went all a little over the top. Vontez Burfik was, was not on, uh, let off on a stretcher. Um, that was a crazy situation because Antonio Brown, after the game, said it was karma. You know, that they, they almost wanted to do that. I actually didn't think that Juju Smith-Schuster hit was that dirty. I thought he was actually leading with his shoulder to go to his chest and just got a little too high in the hit. I don't think he meant to knock out Vontez Burfik in the head. Problem was, like we talked about before the podcast, he stood over him. Yeah, you, you can't stand over and mock a guy like exactly. that. Exactly, and that was the problem. And you even saw Burfick almost tried to fight him and, like, he could Grabbed his leg. Do and, anything. Yeah, yeah. You could see him kind of go limp. Um, the Ioka hit on Brown, that actually suspension ended up getting rescinded. I did think that was more of a bang bang play. Uh, I don't think he was going for Antonio Brown's head. I think just ended up the, the way the play was. He was trying to he was trying to knock the hell out of Antonio Brown, but I don't necessarily think he was trying to hit him in the head. And I think the NFL saw that as well. But we look at this. You just talked about the Gronk um, suspension. To compare the Gronk play with the Juju Smith Schuster play, that's a crackback block Schuster did. Rob Gronkowski, like you said, put all of his weight and gave Tre'Davious White as hard as he could an elbow four seconds after the play while he was out of bounds. I don't understand how the NFL suspends Juju the same as Gronk in this situation. The NFL, there's just no other way to say it, sucks with suspensions. They are terrible. From Ezekiel Elliott to Tom Brady to now Gronk and Juju Smith-Schuster, they need to figure it out because it just doesn't make any sense. A crack black block compared to a, the dirtiest play of all the, the entire year, maybe the last five years, I don't understand it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But the violence in this game was, it was to show you that there's still rivalries in, in, in the NFL. And obviously you need to stop. You don't need to be hitting guys in the head. And it does turn your stomach when that stuff happens. But to see a rivalry game like that, I tweeted out. I actually enjoyed that game. You don't want to see guys getting hurt. But I did enjoy the physicality because you don't get to see that a lot in the NFL anymore. And it was a breath of fresh air. I was more hoping that guys wouldn't be getting hit in the head. That's a little, that's a little, uh, that's a little too much. But yeah, Well said. Uh, yeah, nonetheless... Uh, crazy game and crazy situation just in the NFL with a lot of these uh, suspensions. Uh, Jared, do you care that Ben McAdoo and Jerry Reese were fired and Eli is going to start again? 
Uh, I do not care because this was almost like a <laughs> foregone conclusion. Oh, of course it was. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm a little surprised that Jerry Reese, Jerry Reese, the general manager of the Giants, was fired. Uh, he's basically in charge of creating this roster. So he has a huge say in the, the draft process, who they pick up in free agency. And, and essentially, uh, you know, the, the players that are on the field, they are, they are because of him uh, mainly. Ben McAdoo really, I think, from day one was never able to uh, get the players' respect in the locker room. And obviously, when you don't have the players' respect, these are grown men who are getting paid to play this game. Uh, if they don't respect the head coach, eventually they're going to go out and do their own thing. There are a lot of multiple reports, and you can even see it if you've watched any of these Giants games this year. Uh, they, they've they've definitely just given up on plays and definitely given up on games um, so far, uh, especially the defense. I mean, I, I, there's a play. Uh, I think it was a couple weeks back. It's against the Rams. It was against the Rams. It was it was like third and thirty three or something like ridiculous. Uh, and the Rams threw a screen a screen pass. Jared Goff threw it to Robert Woods. And literally, Robert Woods just, like, ran right up the seam, right up the middle. And, like, the Giants players were going at, like, half speed. Jerry, real quick, what was worse, that play in the Giants game or Tyreek Hill scoring on the uh, the Hail Mary against the Cowboys? Oh, my. Listen, I, I don't want to talk <laughs> about that game. Okay, we're not going to bring that up. Thank you very much. I'm going to stick to how bad the Giants have been. Thank you. We're not going to try and embarrass yeah, my exactly. Cowboys. Uh, but that was pretty bad as well. Yep. Thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, but, no, it, that that – play significantly showed that this Giants team had basically given up not only on the season but I think on their head coach so uh, I think for the Giants players right now I think they're um, happy in a sense that they can get a fresh start obviously for this team right now you know not only do you need a head coach you need a general manager so uh, a lot of retooling reshuffling that's going to happen with this team you know there's been reports is Eli Manning Eli Manning even going to be with the Giants next year. Obviously, he's, paid, he's played his whole career with the Giants so far. But uh, the way that this organization, organization is going, are they even, you know, uh, playoff caliber anymore? Uh, for Eli Manning, he's only got a couple years left. Does he want to stay on a team that's going to be in rebuilding mode? Or does he want to, you know, potentially go to a, another team that has a chance to win a Super Bowl? Uh, that's a no-brainer, obviously. He wants to try to win a Super Bowl in his last couple of years. So um, big changes happening with this Giants team. Um, I, I don't necessarily see this team being too relevant in the next couple of years. I think it's going to take some time for the whoever the new head coach is and whoever the new GM is to get on the same page. You've got pieces. You've got Odo yeah. Beckham Jr. You've got uh, Brandon Marshall, Sherling Steppard. You need help on the offensive line and in the running game. On defense, you have a really good defense. Steve Spagnola is a very, very good defensive coordinator. The The Giants were like top five in defense last year. So you have pieces to build, um, but they definitely need uh, the entire organization to be on the same page. And I think that is what was the downfall uh, with Ben McAdoo and his firing. Nick, last question, and I hope I don't butcher this name. I know I'm going to. Do you care that Shuhei Otoni is... <laughs> Did I say it wrong? No, you got it wrong. Yeah, it's, it's Shohei Otani. Shohei Otani. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry confused. for butchering it. Do you care that he's meeting uh, with seven Major League Baseball teams in L.A. this week? Uh, I do care. No, absolutely, because two of the teams are the Angels and Dodgers. Uh, he seems to want to stay on the West Coast. The only two teams that aren't on the western side of the United States, uh, or on the West Coast, uh, excuse me, are the Texas Rangers and Chicago Cubs. Uh, he seems to want to live on the West Coast. That makes sense. It's close to Japan, and the, the West Coast teams have had a lot of Japanese guys as well. I'm actually surprised the Yankees weren't on this list because of their history with, you have Masahiro Tanaka over there, you have Hideki Matsui, and even Ishiro played a year over at, with the Yankees. So that was a little surprised the Yankees were left off the list. Nonetheless, though, Angels and Dodgers have a chance to get him. This is a guy that you can sign for a very little amount of money, so there's not too much financial risk. The Angels just actually got a top prospect in, in Kevin Maton, who was uh, kicked off the Atlanta Braves because of a, a scandal with their international signing, bon uh, signing. So the Angels seem like they're going for it this year, which is good because it seems like the last couple years they haven't, and they've kind of just stocked the roster. So good for them that they're going for it. Dodgers, obviously, this has a big deal with them as well because Otani and the Stanton kind of thing are connected as well. We're, we're, we're kind of seeing it. If the Dodgers lose the Otani sweepstakes, they might go harder after Stanton. If they get Otani, they might not, not go after Stanton. So it, it, it's, all, it's, it's all in there. As far as the rest of the teams in the league go that, that, that he might go to, I, I, 
I believe it's the, the Mariners and the Padres are a high choice as well. Those are kind of just teams because they're on the West Coast, it seems like. It seems like the Angels or Dodgers and then maybe Texas and Chicago would probably be at least my front runners for him to sign for. But those are better teams, and those are teams with a clear path for next year or a clear plan. So, uh, But it's very interesting, um, especially in L.A. here. you got Stanton having teams meet him in L.A. You have Otani having teams meet in L.A. Hopefully these fires don't make Otani not want to stay in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> because it'd be pretty crazy you come over here and you have five different fires surrounding your area in here in L.A. So, uh, nonetheless, uh, good for baseball that we got. Uh, and the cool thing about Otani, by the way, is he hits and pitches. And he can hit and pitch as uh, just the same. Wow, very so, rare. Very, very rare. rare player coming into the MLB. we got to take a break. We'll be back with our final segment. We're going to talk a little college football. Head Final Four is announced, and we got the Bulls announced. So we got... College football, we got the bowls all set up. We'll talk all about that on the other side of this break. It's coming to podcast on OC Rock Radio. It's truly a great honor and a privilege to be standing here in front of you in Aggieland today. It really is. Uh, I've always admired Texas A&M from afar and appreciated what it had. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to be here at Texas A&M. And this is without a doubt one of college football's greatest sp- sports venues and richest traditions. And within the short amount of time that I've been here, all that said, the people here are incredible. Let's start with the game that will be played AT&T Stadium. Oh. The Goodyear Cotton Bowl wow. Classic. You know what I'm talking about? I, I love it. <laughs> USC I mean, and Ohio State, it feels like Pasadena they're going to play. I don't college. care if these two teams were in the Blue Bonnet Bowl. You put Ohio State and USC together on any field and those uniforms together, sign me and USC, up. a chance to make a statement. Number four and going to the playoff to face Clemson will be the Alabama Crimson Tide <laughs> for the fourth straight year. Is there, is there somebody missing? Hey, no, come on, come Herbie. Set. Herbie, come back. I, I cannot. We, we I have a first the time come that come two teams from the same conference are going to the playoff. Alabama's been in every playoff now, and we get Clemson, Alabama. Part three. Cover two podcast back on OC Rock Radio for our final segment of the show. And uh, this is all about college football. Nick, the uh, Final Four rankings came out. And uh, I guess you could say we had a little bit of a shock with that number four team coming shocked. in. A little bit. Yeah, so we got the, the rankings came out. Uh, all of the bowl games have been announced. It's going to be a, a great New Year's Day. We've got some big time matchups, even uh, one in particular big time matchup on uh, Friday the 29th that we will definitely get into uh, between USC and Ohio State. I know Nick wants to talk about that. But uh, Nick, let, let's first jump right into it. Uh, with the rankings, the top four teams, we've got Clemson coming in at number one, Oklahoma at number two, two Georgia at number three, and uh, Alabama mm. getting back into that it. That was number, the wild card. Yeah, that was the wild card, getting back into it at number four. So give me your thoughts on these four rankings, and, and what do you think about Alabama? Well, the first three clearly I'm okay with that. Uh, Clemson just destroying Miami um, in the AC Championship Bowl, Oklahoma taking care of TCU, and Georgia beating Auburn uh, pretty, you know, uh, pretty soundly too. Those top three, those do not, those are this exactly what I thought they'd be. But then it came to number four, and ESPN did a good job of kind of hold when they when they had their little uh, they had their show announcing it before all the NFL games started. They did a good job of really making you wait and anticipate. And I was actually in the sports book in Las Vegas waiting. Everybody was watching, and we had a lot of Ohio State fans that were disappointed because Alabama got in. Now, the thing about Alabama, and I actually think I'm not too mad they got in because you people want to see Alabama play in, in the national championship, and Alabama more than likely is good enough to be in that fourth spot. But the way their schedule was this year, and they really didn't beat anybody really good, whereas all these other teams beat very good teams. You look at you look at Georgia. Georgia beat Notre Dame and, and Auburn. They beat Auburn the second time. Uh, Oklahoma beat Ohio State and TCU twice. Uh, Clemson killed Miami. Uh, Alabama beat Mississippi State and an injured Florida State team. So, And they lost to the only good team they played. So that was my only thing. On Alabama, Ohio State, they, it, it, I could see, I could see them getting in as well. But that's the thing that the two losses, I think, might just get the committee. Um, it might just change their mind a little bit. It might be a little uh, 
step they need to take. But the two losses, I think, affected them. I actually thought, amazingly enough, USC, the way their, their strength of schedule, I did not realize was that good. I thought their strength of schedule might end up getting them into that fourth spot. USC ranked way down at number eight below Auburn and Wisconsin. I'm a little disappointed uh, because the committee said conference championships matter. And Wisconsin and Auburn did not win their conference championship game. So I'm a little surprised that USC isn't up in that sixth spot, at least, in the rankings. But I'm actually okay with Alabama being in because we know they're more than likely good enough. But it just seems like the committee is a little hypocritical on some of their rules and some of the ways they explain these teams get in because it did not seem like Alabama was going to get in from the committee's take. And then they kind of went back on all of it and ended up putting them in anyway. So yeah. a little disappointing. I, I, I told you last week, Alabama, it, because of their history, because of Nick Saban, I had a feeling that... Uh, and that's what happened, too. Yeah, that, that they were going to get in. And listen, um, obviously they went 11-1. and one. They had one hiccup against Auburn. Um, their their schedule. You can make the argument that their schedule was not as tough. But then from Alabama's side, you can make the argument that hey, listen, we play in the SEC. It's not our fault that that you know the teams that we played this year, um, you know, weren't uh, having as good of seasons. The the LSU's and the Mississippi States and started out strong yeah. and then kind of tanked towards the end of the year. They're like, that's not our fault. We still play in the SEC, and and every year it seems like we have a tough schedule. So I was not one bit surprised that Alabama was able to get into that fourth spot. Um, yeah, if, if you're Ohio State, um, you know, you, you have to be sitting there and kind of kicking yourself about the, the two losses that uh, they had earlier in the year. Um, Mainly the one to Iowa. Yeah, no, that that was a, a big one. And listen, it was on the road. Iowa was a, a tough team to play at home at night. It seems like, it seems like the last couple of years, Iowa has always gotten that home night game against a, a top 10 That's ranked true. opponent, right? It seems like Iowa is, is a very, very tough opponent to play, or a tough team to play at home. So that was obviously their biggest blunder of the year. And then uh, they did lose to Oklahoma earlier in the season, an, another team who's in the top four. So, um, you know, if you're Ohio State, you're kind of saying, hey, we lost to, you know, two good teams. We, we beat Wisconsin uh, uh, in a close game, but we still beat them in our Big Ten championship um so you know for them they're kind of like hey how come maybe we should have gotten a better look over Alabama um obviously Wisconsin even though they were highly ranked I think you and I both agree that they had essentially no they had chance to, go on to get in they had to go on because of the schedule yes. and their, their strength of schedule in a sense um Auburn getting schwacked by Georgia uh, that essentially kicked them out, right? Yeah, no, that totally. was there was there was no chance after that they're getting in. And, and for USC, uh, I do agree with you that looking back on their schedule throughout the year, it is a little better than what I originally thought. But I think it was uh, the I guess that the inconsistency in their two losses that they had, and I think that the way that they lost yeah. coming into the yeah. year, I think they were ranked number five. Or I think what? they were ranked number was two. It higher than that, I was it number it was two? Like number two or three? Yeah, yeah. No, they, they were very, very highly ranked. And then to lose to Washington State, Washington State, it's a good team, but to to, to lose to them, um, and then to get killed essentially by Notre Dame. Yeah, um, who ended up not being that good of a team in the long no, run. No, they, they weren't. But I. Th- the committee had really, really high expectations for USC, and I think they sent a message to them that, hey, listen, you guys aren't in the SEC, so you're not in the toughest conference in yeah. college football, um, and because of the way that you guys did lose to Notre Dame and and Washington State, and don't remember, earlier in the year when they played at home against Texas, they barely won in the game-winning field goal. True. So they could have easily had three losses on the year. So I think the committee was like, uh, USC, you're a good team, but this year you're a little too inconsistent, you're not a great team. So because of that, um, I, I like I said, I think they just went back to Alabama and said, hey, this is Alabama. Yeah. We know it's going to be a good matchup. And, of course, what do we get uh, the, the first game? We get the, the championship rematch. Yeah, I know. For the last two years, we get Clemson-Alabama uh, in the first round of these playoffs. So obviously these two teams know each other very well. Um, I think it's going to be a, a great game um, between these two teams. Once again, obviously, a lot of guys have left from both teams going to the NFL and graduating and all that stuff. So um, uh, player-wise, completely different teams. But both head coaches are still there. The schemes are still the same. They both know each other. So that's going to be a, a fantastic matchup. And then you've got Georgia and Oklahoma. 
right? You've got Georgia with the, the great defense, oh, yeah, it's gonna be in great. my opinion, and Oklahoma, who's got, in my opinion, uh, the most high-powered and best offense with more than likely the Heisman Trophy winner and Baker Mayfield leading that attack. So two fantastic Final Four matchups, in my opinion, uh, and, and I can't wait for New Year's Day. Yeah, no, it's going to be cool. And, and we look back on it uh, with, with the Alabama pick because you, you made some good points. I think USC, they lack that signature win against a good team. We talk about Alabama. They didn't have a signature win against a good team. USC did. They beat Stanford twice, Stanford's middle-of-the-road rankings. Uh, they lost to Washington State. That was another team they could have beat. Um, they lost to Notre Dame. That could have been a significant win. So I, I think it, they lacked that significant win, which is why maybe they didn't get higher in the rankings as well. Uh, but you talk about these matchups. I mean, you, you, what's cool about and this is what's cool about college football, and this is why I wish bowls more more like this. You look at the Rose Bowl, and the Rose Bowl is – Traditionally, Big Ten versus Pac-12. Yes. Normally, you at least have one of those teams. This year, though, you have Oklahoma and Georgia playing in the Rose Bowl because of the Final Four. How often do you see Georgia play in the Rose Bowl? And how, how often do you see Oklahoma playing in the Rose Bowl? That's a cool thing to see. So that's just an added element even to that game that I want to watch because I want to see what that looks like. I want to see Baker Mayfield play in the Rose Bowl. I personally believe the Rose Bowl... It's the best stadium in the United States. I think it's the best place to play. The weather seems to always be perfect when they play that game, and it should be the same uh, when they play that game New Year's Day. And then you have Alabama and Clemson. Hopefully, I'm just, I'm just saying this, hopefully Alabama does not do what Ohio State did and question the committee by getting schlacked by Clemson. If you can remember, Clemson, I believe, beat Ohio State 31 nothing last Whoops. year. And there was question of why Ohio State was in the game. There's question of why Alabama is in this game. So hopefully they put on a good performance and show that they deserve. Or we're going to have that discussion, oh, should Ohio State have been in? Should UFC, USC have been in? Should Wisconsin have been in? So you want to see... Uh, both these games be really good and show you that the committee's doing a good job. Maybe we're wrong. Maybe we're wrong about the teams. Uh, and, so, and why are we questioning them? So hopefully that's good. Let's talk about, we just talked about USC. They have a chance to prove that they're better than Ohio State because they play Ohio State in the Cotton Bowl. It's number five versus number eight. I believe this is the best bowl there is this year, besides the Final Four, of course. Uh, the Cotton Bowl is going to be played at AT&T Stadium. You mentioned something. Uh, last time USC played in AT&T Stadium, they got killed by Alabama. So something to prove maybe even there. But, Jared, what do you see uh, going into this USC-Ohio State game? Who do you actually end up seeing winning this game? You know, this is, it's a toss-up. Um, I, I definitely am a fan of USC. Follow them because we are in Southern California. And yes. We just get to, uh, I guess, see them on TV a little more than we do Ohio State 10 team. Um, l- listen, both teams are ex- very, very talented. Um, I think the thing with USC is, can their defense hold up? Offensively, they can come out and score 40 points whenever they want, essentially, uh, with Sam Darnold leading their their quarterback attack. On defense, I I think they've been way too suspect. Um, You've seen games this year where, uh, you know, they they give up less than 20 points. Um, They've done that uh, numerous times uh, this season. Um, But then you see games where they come out and, you know, they gave up, 31 to Western Michigan to begin the year. Um, you give up 24 to Texas. That's that's a decently ranked team. You get swacked by Notre Dame. You give up 49. Um, I, I just I don't know if USC's defense will be able to handle JT Barrett and the Ohio State offense. JT Barrett, by the way, not 100%. Um, he had surgery right after that Michigan game. Uh, and essentially had th- like three or four days to prepare for Wisconsin. Um, he was, you could tell that he was not, you know, completely healthy. He was limping out. But uh, uh, Urban Meyer was still running quarterback zone reads for JT Barrett. So he was still giving him the ball, still letting him run. Um, and now the fact that you essentially have close to a month off to prepare. Yes. Uh, I think JT Barrett will be as close to 100% as he's been all year with all this time off. And I, I think the Ohio State offense scares me a little too much. So, um, unfortunately, I, I'm going to give this to Ohio State in a close game. I just don't trust the USC defense to come up with big plays when needed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I actually think USC business Sam Darnold could end up winning this game. I think he's the X factor. 
Okay. Uh, but it's, I, I just saw what he did with Penn State against Penn State last year. And then Penn State probably was a better team than USC. But Sam Darnold willed them to win a big game. And you saw after the Pac-12 championship how happy Darnold was to win a big game, to win the Pac-12. I believe it was the first time USC had won it since 2008, back when Pete Carroll was coach. You wouldn't have thought that because they were in the Rose Bowl last year. And they've been a pretty good team, but they, they have not won the Pac-12. The Pac-12 have been won, I think, by a North Division team since USC won it in 2008. So it was either Oregon or Stanford or Washington most of those years. But so it seems like when, it, when there's big games, he tends to step up. And maybe during the games, we talk about this Cal, Western Michigan, maybe he just doesn't play as well because he plays down to the competition. But it seems like in big games, he plays well. I think that's enough of an edge for a pretty even matchup for USC to get this game. Oh. I'm not going to bet against Sam Darnold. That's kind of what I'm saying. I got you. He seems to uh, step up. And, and JT Barrett seems to essentially not step up a lot in, the, in these moments. And you mentioned he's injured. He does have times so he probably won't be injured by then. But that is enough of a factor to, for me to give USC the game. Yeah, no, like I said, I, I'm not, you know, sitting here saying Sam Darnold of course, and USC yeah, I told, are, I are that, not yes. legitimate or don't deserve to be here. They completely do. I'm just saying on a week-to-week basis – uh, consistency, that word again that we've said multiple times throughout this show, I don't trust their defense to stop Ohio State for 60 minutes. I think they can do it for a quarter, maybe even two, um, but I, eventually I think JT Bear and this offense is it's too high-powered and too talented, um, and, and I think they're just going to find a way to put up you know three more points on the board uh, than, than USC will. But I think this could be somewhat of a shootout. I can I can easily see the score in the 30s, potentially in the 40s, because I think both of these teams are are more offensively talented than they are on defense, uh, and so yeah, I I could see this game being more more of a shootout, uh, um, no doubt. Yeah, no, I I I hope it is. There's a lot with a lot of these bulls. If you're not in the final four, you want to win these bulls to be, but to be honest. It is a little bit of a disappointment oh, of course, when you're no one doubt. of these good teams that kind of gets snubbed from the Final Four that you're in the Cotton Bowl or you're in the Rose Bowl. It shouldn't be that way, but the way they've kind of created it in college football, that's the way it is. So Ohio State and USC, although I do believe they'll want to prove to each other, or maybe Ohio State and USC will go, hey, maybe we should have been in the Final Four. Let, let, let's try to beat the crap out of our opponent, you know? Uh, if you remember, TCU did that a while back when they got snubbed and then they end up killing whoever they played in their bowl game, showing maybe we should have been in the, in, in the Final Four. Nonetheless, though, uh, I hope the game's entertaining because you are excited about the Final Four and there's these other bowls there the kind of days before. They're essentially games that, that don't mean too much besides to the team and to the school uh, getting a Cotton Bowl because the Pac-12, like I mentioned, and, and uh, the Big Ten is used to winning the Rose Bowl. So maybe even a little disappointed they're not playing in the Rose Bowl as well. Uh, nonetheless, hopefully the game is good. Uh, let's, I just saw something interesting. I did not know this. Wisconsin and Miami are playing in the Orange Bowl. That's a home game for Miami. Oh, yeah. I just realized that. I mean, that doesn't seem very fair, but you know, the ACC champ goes to the, the Orange Bowl, that, and so that it makes a little bit of sense. I mean, I, I will say Miami isn't necessarily like, you know, they don't have the the greatest home field advantage. Yeah. Um. I, it's not like they they packed at the stands with a hundred thousand fans like True. Ohio State or USC does. So, yes, they do get to stay at home. They do get the advantage of not having to travel. Um. But I, I don't think it's going to be a thing where Wisconsin is going to have trouble. You know, noise trouble. Um. When they're on offense, because I I just don't see Miami as having that big of a home field advantage with their crowd, with their fans. So um, I get what you're saying, but I don't think that is going to be a reason why Wisconsin you know, would not win this game. Gotcha. And I just want to mention that. No, no, it, it, it's a very interesting fact yeah. because it doesn't get to happen too often. No, it doesn't. Unless, I mean, for, for you know, USC uh, or, or a Pac-12 team like UCLA, yes, if they get to play in the Rose Bowl, that is, I guess that would, that's probably one of the, one of the more consistent uh. Uh, home bowl games for teams. But yeah, you don't really get to see it too often uh, within other conferences because the, the games are more spread out. Totally. Uh, so I wanted to say this, uh, one more thing about the, the games, then we'll talk about the coaches in a second. Um, UCF and Auburn. This, this is an underrated game. Both the, UCF is a good team. They are undefeated this year. They played a crazy game against Memphis in the, um, the uh, American Athletic Conference championship game. 
And Auburn, obviously, we know what their offense can do and what their defense can do. I think this is a great matchup. I think UCF could win the game as well. Uh, I, I think, although Auburn's defense is really good, I do think UCF is underrated because they're in the, like I said, the American Athletic Conference. You ask many people, they probably won't even know that they'll be like, ACC? You talking about <laughs> ACC? Yeah. But uh, so I think this is an underrated matchup. I think US, UCF could win this game. I'm telling you guys, watch that game. That's going to be a good game. It's going to be, is that on New Year's Day or is that on the, no, the it's New day Year's before? Day. It's New Year's, New Year's day. day. So that's an early game before, that's a game to watch to start your day, kind of that New Year's Day. Um, before the Rose Bowl and all, and, and the and the Final Four starts, that's going to be a good game. I'm telling you, just I'm essentially just telling you to watch that game because it's going to be good. I, I'm not saying it won't be good. I think Auburn is way too talented. And looking at uh, UCF's schedule, who who have they played? I I don't see anyone on this schedule. <laughs> Half the teams I you know somewhat don't even recognize. Um, I, I mean. South Florida, maybe be their, their South Florida best was win. solid. Memphis was pretty good this year, but no, I that's what that's what I'm saying. I, I'm just saying if you watch them play, they do seem like a power five team when they play. They do. I, I think Auburn uh, is going to come out with uh, a lot of anger, um, seeing as how one week they beat Alabama and they're kind of on top of the world, and then the next week they come out and get whooped by Georgia. So I think they're gonna, you know, be a little pissed off and have something to prove in this bowl game, um, wishing that you know they're obviously in a higher bowl, potentially in the top four playoff. So um, yeah, I'm not trying to discredit uh, UCF at all, but I think Auburn could, I could see uh, this game, you know, being somewhat of a blowout. That that's just me. I I think Auburn's gonna come out, like I said, be pissed off and, and just want to come up and put out like 80 points, which I'm not saying they're going to, but. With their their spread offense and the way that they they operate, they're gonna come out and they're just gonna want to score, 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 and and put it on them and say, hey, listen, we screwed up because we lost to Georgia, but we're a better team than that. Yeah, no, interesting. It should be an interesting game. Hopefully, it's good. Like we we're mentioning, yes. these bowls a lot of times, especially to a team like Auburn playing UCF, they might not go into it thinking too much. They mm-hmm. might think it's an easy win, but there's a lot of times those games end up being tough games. If you remember yep. Teddy Bridgewater, uh, I believe they Louisville. played f- Florida Florida State in the game and ended up beating them. Yeah, so. Uh, the, it's it's always interesting to watch the teams from the non Power Five conference play a team like Auburn, who was this close to the national championship. That should be an interesting game to watch. All right, let's move on. Uh, we want to talk about UCF. They are going to have a different coach. Scott Frost was hired at Nebraska. He is uh, just he's going to Nebraska. He did the old uh, Tom Herman and kind of just left the team. There was rumors that he might go to Texas A and M or somewhere like that. He ends up going to Nebraska. Uh, what do you think about that hire, real quick? Uh, listen, I, I cannot blame Scott Frost at all. Uh, listen, you get an opportunity to, uh, you know, build a reputation at, at a smaller program, which is what a lot of these coaches, whether it's college football or basketball or whatever, that's what you do. You start a small program, uh, you build a winning culture, you win games, and when one of these big time Power Five conference conference uh, uh, coaching vacancies opens up. Uh, you have to jump on it, and it's uh, fortunately for you know these smaller schools um, like UCF and all these you know other schools that are uh, having these coaches leave. It's not one of those things where they don't want to be there. It's just the money and uh, the recruiting ability and just the things that these bigger programs can offer. It's true. You, I, in my opinion, you can't fault these coaches. So congratulations to him. He's obviously earned it, um, and, and now he gets. This is going to be the real test. Right? How good of a coach is he? Yeah. Because you, you did it on, the, on, I guess, a smaller scale, but now you're in the big time. Now you're in the SEC. Right? Now you're going to be going up against Alabama every every year and Georgia every well, other Nebraska's year. Nebraska's in the Big Ten. Or Nebraska. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know why I'm thinking yeah, yeah, Arkansas, yeah. Big Ten. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, for <laughs> yeah. some reason, I was thinking Arkansas. Yeah, 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 I, totally, I'm sorry totally. about that. Um, still, even in the Big, big Ten. Big Ten still, though. No, it's not, it's it's still, not a slouch. It's not a slouch at all. You, you still have Ohio State, Wisconsin. Um, uh, no, it, whether regardless if it's the SEC or the Big Ten, uh, the point is this is a step up in competition, and now we're really going to see how well you can recruit and uh, you know if you can turn this Arkansas program around. Absolutely. Uh, you said Arkansas again, Nebraska. Nebraska. Did I? Yeah, you said, yeah. I'm thinking not here about today. Arkansas I'm too. I'm thinking about Arkansas, Arkansas too much. I'm what is, about it, what is it about Arkansas? I don't know. I saw Arkansas getting... on the screen, and <laughs> apparently that's <laughs> yeah, you the thing I'm thinking about right now. Yeah, that's funny. Um, but so, 
Interesting enough, Kevin Sum. Well, Kevin Sum. We'll talk about another coach getting hired. Probably the biggest one. Uh, Kevin Sum. When they were, thought might go to UCF, they ended up not getting him. Um, that's interesting. But we'll move on to Jimbo Fisher, who is moving from Florida State to Texas A and M. Not we a surprise. We talked about this last week. I thought it was a surprise. Uh, we talked about this last week. Jimbo Fisher, uh, and he takes a giant contract. Ten years, $75 million. It's like a baseball contract he took to go to Texas A&M. Since I, I obviously know you, you thought he would go, then you thought it was a good idea. What did you think about the contract that he got and, and the press conference and all that? Yeah, no, I mean, that's the reason why he did leave. Like, you, you, don't, you don't turn down $75 million. No. I don't care how far, you know, they spread it out, five years, ten years, whatever. Um, the opportunity to to set your family, not to say that he was making you know crumbs over at Florida State because he wasn't, but the chance to be the second highest coach only behind Nick Saban, uh, you, you can't pass that up. I guess the the only thing um, negative wise that I would say about this is the fact that I think right now Florida State is set up as a better team personnel wise than than Texas A and M is. So. It's gonna it's gonna take more work and uh, you know a lot more recruiting for Jimbo Fisher. Um, he, he's not obviously Texas A and M is a good team, but he's walking into more of a rebuilding process than he is at Florida State. But listen, when you're getting seven and a half million dollars a year, uh, that type of pressure should be on you and yep. is is expected. So, um, and he also gets moved. You know, you're bumping up. You're you're in the SEC now. So. Um, I, I think it's it's a welcome challenge for him, something that he uh, obviously is not taking going to take lightly. And I think it's going to take a couple years. I think by the second or third year, I think that's when uh, the real expectations for Texas A&M and Jimbo Fisher should be put in place. If anyone thinks that Texas A&M is going to come out and this SEC and you know win their conference, beat Alabama, and get in a top four playoff bowl, I think they're out of their minds. Yeah, I, I, I think, listen, this is still Kevin Sumlin's team uh, this year and going into next year. These are true, still for them. And his for, recruits. Yes, th- these recruits are still his guys. So you're going to have to give Jimbo Fisher a year or two. Just like I say with every coach that comes into a new situation, you have to give that coach at least a couple years to bring in their own players and get their philosophy across. Um, I, I can't stand it when uh, teams and organizations – fire a coach after one year it's like what do you expect the guy to do he's coming into a completely new situation they're not necessarily his players that he's been able to bring on for his system so give the guy a couple years um let him work out some kinks you know listen if texas a&m goes seven and five next year listen you you're gonna have to deal with it right nick saban went seven and five his first year in alabama and and look what he's done so um I, i don't think that Jimbo Fisher will do what Nick Saban did with Alabama, but I think he can definitely get this team further than Kevin Sumlin did. Uh, Kevin Sumlin did so. Uh, good hire by Texas A&M, uh, and Florida State uh, has already replaced uh, their vacancy yep. as they they take uh, Willie, or, Taggart. Willie Taggart. Willie Taggart, uh, supposedly his dream job uh, to to move on to Florida State after being with Oregon for one year. Nick, what do you think about that hire? I don't really understand it to be honest. I guess the guy's dream job, but. Oregon has not been that good last. Like Weren't they like seven and five. I, well, I wasn't mean, he only at Oregon? He was only at Oregon one for one year. One year. What the hell? Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I don't understand that. I feel like that was more of like a, a pressure hire for Florida State. Real quick, we'll see how he does. But I mean, it, Oregon was not that good this year. They were not one of the better teams in the Pac-12. I mean, even UCLA whooped on them this year, and UCLA was a six and six team. So, uh, I understand that that much. Um, it, it's. It, I do think it was just really a, a quick hire by Florida State. I think they just wanted to get someone in there, and hey, we'll attack, we'll attack this guy. Maybe he has that 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 Florida um, recruiting uh, thing because he, he was at South he, Florida. Yeah, he did recruit seven Florida players to Oregon. Yeah, this so past maybe year. that's why they want. But I just don't. I don't think that's a championship hire. I think that's more of just a quick hire. Yeah, yeah. Quickly. Uh, yeah, real I quick. kept saying Arkansas because today they did that's hire was. SMU's yeah. Chad Morris. Uh, to a six-year contract worth $21 million. Yeah, so SMU. Congratulations to him. Absolutely. I kept seeing Arkansas on like that's the, what it was, the top, yep. and that's why I kept saying them. Uh, I apologize, Nebraska. <laughs> you 
Frost. Just disrespecting yeah, yeah, Nebraska. Yeah, no, the whole not at all. Podcast. Not at all. Nothing against them. I just I kept seeing Arkansas <laughs> hiring a new coach. That's why I kept saying that. So apologies. And real quick, because we have one minute left, Ole Miss uh, two year bowl ban, uh, de- essentially death penalty. Oof. Anybody can transfer there or transfer away from there. Just real quick thoughts on uh, Ole Miss. We got a minute left. Yeah. No. Uh, there's there's going to be a lot of transfers. If if I'm a freshman or a sophomore, I'm more than Get likely the hell transferring. Out. Get the I'm, hell I'm out, out of there. Ole Miss. If, if I'm a junior or senior, maybe you stay because you're more than likely almost finished uh, with with football and with your education. But uh, if you're a young player, uh, you're gonna be they're gonna be gone, and it's gonna be one of those situations to where almost like USC in a sense, where you're gonna lose scholarships, you're not gonna get those four or five star recruits anymore. You're gonna have to work with two or three star recruits, and it's gonna be a tough couple of years for them. So, uh, but listen, they they essentially put this on themselves, and this is the punishment. Yeah, no, I mean, they totally did to themselves. Uh, they got Kemdichi and Treadwell probably illegally. Now that you look back on it, so unfortunate, but that's what happens. Uh, you hear the music right there. Uh, that means it's the end of the podcast. Good podcast today, yeah, Jared. Yeah, great show. Uh, we will be back next Wednesday with more uh, more sports talk. That's Cover 2 Podcast on OC Rock Radio.